we all have many different paths, right? But specifically talking about the journey to the promised land. That's what we're talking about. And we talked about the keys to a successful journey, Muhammad. Um, basically, the journey to the promised land, which is in two aspects. You're talking about eternal life being with being with Jesus where he is but also coming into an understanding of who God is so as we grow as we journey as we grow, journey into the promised land as we journey into eternal life we are coming into the knowledge of who God is right that's the purpose of life it's to it's to be saved and to know God that's the purpose of life so when we talked about Joshua we talked about the keys to a successful journey okay we can guarantee, you can guarantee your salvation by doing the things that I explained yesterday and what we're going to expound on today. God's faithfulness is the first key. God is faithful to start what he's going to finish. Okay? But one thing we have to understand is that we're in an agreement with God. We are in a covenant with God. Okay, that's what an agreement is. It's a covenant between you and God. Okay, just like marriage till death do us part. Right. And you have just as God has a responsibility to be faithful and he wants to be faithful. We have a responsibility to upkeep our end of the bargain. So we talked about God's faithfulness as being the first key. So let's go to I want to expound more on our duty as believers on our journey on our keeping our part of the covenant so God's faithfulness is the first one the first one is and the second one we can just type it like this it's obedience. But there's more to it. So Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 7 real quick. So between verse 1 and verse 7 or verse 6. God was explaining how he's going to be faithful. How he said you will be prosperous in, in, this, in this journey to, to the promised land. You will succeed. But then he says this. This is what God tells Joshua. He says, only be thou strong and very courageous. Only be strong and only be courageous to do what? That you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Now, this is what I got. This is what you have to understand. You have to read the Old Testament again, like I said, through the lens of the gospel, because we're not we're not under Moses. We're under Jesus. The Bible says that grace, the law was given by Moses. Right. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So that's the covenant between you and God through Christ. OK, so now when God says obey all that Moses has commanded, what does that say to you? Obey all that Jesus commanded. Okay? Now, does it mean that we can just throw Moses out the window? Because they they go hand in hand. Okay? Does it mean that you can continue sinning? Because Jesus expounds on the law. We know that in the Gospels, as Jesus expounds on the law, he says, the law says this. You shall not... Uh, you shall not commit adultery, but it says, I say this. Any man that looks upon a woman has already committed adultery. So we know that Jesus expounds on the law. So we're not throwing Moses away. We just have to understand that there we are under a different covenant. We're under a different agreement where Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. That we may come into a relationship with the Father and that we will be a son and he will be a father to us through Jesus Christ, right? Okay, so he says, obey all. He says, be strong and courageous that you may observe to do all that is according to the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. So in essence, obey the word of Jesus. Obey the doctrine of Christ. And then he says, and don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left, meaning don't turn to your own ways. 
Don't turn to your own thinking. Don't turn to the right hand or to the left hand, but keep yourselves consistent in the word of God. He said that you may prosper wherever you go. And how many of you guys want to prosper into eternal life, right? And you want to prosper in every aspect of your life. Well, there's one path. Jesus says narrow is the way. That's the path. And he says straight is the gate. He's the gate, narrows the gate to enter into life and narrows the way that leads to life. Narrow. Narrow. Narrows the way, guys. And how do we know that? Because there's only one way in. By following Jesus. Just like there's only one way into this world and there's only one way out of this world, there's only one way to heaven and that's through Jesus Christ. So he wants you to prosper wherever you go. But the only way that you can do that is by submitting yourself to the doctrine of Christ and obedience to it. And he says that the book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. We're going to talk about meditating. That you may observe to do all that is written. Now let me ask you a question. In order to obey, in order to do all that God has written, can we be, do we have to be consistent or inconsistent in the word? We have to be consistent. Now, if there's an area that we lack in our lives where we don't have the knowledge, but we've been consistent, do you think that God is going to fill that gap? Absolutely. But if we lack knowledge because we've been neglecting what God has called us to do, which is to meditate on his word day and night, then we've, the Bible says, my people perish Huh? Okay. Then the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Right? In fact, it even goes deeper in Hosea 6. It says, my people perish for lack of knowledge because, and it says, because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. You see, that's the essence of this. That's, that's the covenant right there. God doesn't want us to reject the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He wants us to embrace it. He wants us to meditate on it day and night. And he says that you may do, observe all that is written in it. All that is written in the Gospels. And what's the Gospels, folks? It's the life of Jesus and everything that stems from it. That's it. He says, for then you shall make your way prosperous. This is the key. This is the key to heaven. Then you'll make your way prosperous. And then you'll have good success. Then he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid. Neither be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. When you do this, God is with you. Do you think that God is lying? He's not. He's with you. When you do this. He's faithful in all things. And when you've gone astray, you can, he, he's going to draw you back to himself. Or he's going to attempt to draw you back. But you have to keep your part. If you don't keep your part, how can you prosper? Because he give, he's giving you the, the keys to success. He's giving you the way to prosperity. And I'm not talking about natural prosperity. I'm talking about prospering spiritually, growing in Jesus. He says, this is how you're going to prosper. Listen to me. Here's my dearly beloved son. Hear ye him. That's what the scripture says. You've got to listen to Jesus. You have to keep your eyes on him. Okay? So, first, so John 1, 17 says, again, I mentioned it before. It says that the law was given by Moses. And remember how I said we're under a different covenant. Okay? But it says grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What we're looking to obey, folks. What we're looking to obey is grace and truth. I don't know what your understanding of what grace is. But let me show you what grace is. Y'all turn to Titus real quick. Turn to the book of Titus chapter 2.
Y'all there? Whenever y'all ready, say y'all ready. Uh, Titus is after Timothy, 2 Timothy. Yep. You there? Titus through two. Let's go like this. Let's do. Okay. So I'm going to explain to you guys what grace and truth is. What grace is. Okay. Because many people have a misunderstanding of what grace is. And God wants us to have an understanding of what grace is. Because many people think that grace is God's, uh, God uh, overlooking things. Right? They think grace is God saying, well, you know, it's okay. You know, he, he believes already. He's, he can continue doing the things that he's doing. But that's not what grace is. So I'm going to show you. In Titus 2, verse 11, it says, for the grace of God. Here we go. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Okay? How did it appear? Through who? Through Jesus. The instruction that God has given us that we may be saved is for is is here. It came through Jesus. So this is what he's saying. And let's listen. He says teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. So what does grace do? Grace is a teacher. Grace instructs you. What does grace instruct you to do? It just says it. Yes. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. And what is ungodliness? It's the things that the world does. It's the things that God, that Jesus wouldn't do. It's living in a way that God did not live when he lived on earth. That's ungodliness. So grace teaches us. So many people do not understand that. They think grace is just God's love that overlooks everything that they do when they willfully do it. That is not grace, folks. It's instruction for God that we did not have before that brings us into a right relationship with God and into the promised land. We have to obey the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. So it says he teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. And it teaches us to live soberly. Soberly, like when a person is drunk and then they they stop drinking. And they say, man, I've been sober for X amount of months or years. Well, how are we sober? We're sober when we refrain from the things of the world. From the sins that we used to indulge in. I can say I've been sober since 2012. Refraining from the exercising the sins that I used to exercise. Being drunk off the wine of the world. Sober. That's what it teaches us. To live soberly. And then it says righteously. What is righteousness? Righteousness is first. It's the state that everyone is in that believes in Jesus. You're righteous when you believe in Jesus, what he has done for you. You're made right with God in that, in that moment that you believe. Right? But righteousness is also an action. <laughs> righteousness is also what you do. Righteousness is also doing the will of God. Did you know that? Yeah. Righteousness is not only the condition that you're in, when you believe in Jesus, God looks at you, he sees his son, but it's also a lifestyle that proceeds from true and genuine faith. And it says, in living godly in the present world, this is what the grace of God teaches us. And it says it also teaches us to look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. To look how many of you are looking for Jesus to come? There's so many believers that are not looking for Jesus to come because they don't want him to come because they want to live their lives first. You understand? 
They want to be successful first. They have ambitions and they have dreams that they want to fulfill. But when you have the grace of God and the truth of God in your heart, you want to see the king, even if it disrupts what you have planned for your life. There should be a longing. There should be a desire. There should be a passion that you have. You should be looking for him. Do you look for the king? We know that time is short. All the signs are here. The Bible's coming to pass right before people. You better look now. The Bible says, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Look and wait for him and want him to come. Don't allow life to rob you of eternal life. Because when he comes, if you're like, man, he's here because I wanted to finish my life and he disrupts your life, that's not a good position to be in. You want him to disrupt some things in your life. You want him to. You should. You want him to. So when we abide in the teachings of Christ, Christ this is the fruit that God wants to see in our lives when we abide in the grace of God. Right, Muhammad? So it says here, looking for the blessed hope. That's the eternal life, folks. The kingdom of heaven that Jesus has prepared for us. And the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. You see that? Why did Jesus give himself for us? To redeem you from all iniquity. And to purify you. To be a peculiar people. Zealous of good works. That's what God wants. That's the fruit, folks. That's what the grace of God ministers. That's what it produces. When the gospel's in your heart, this is what will come forth. Everything that you want to see in this life begins with a seed. But when the gospel is planted in your heart, and it's watered, and it begins to grow, this is the life that it will bring forth. You will deny ungodliness and worldly lust. You will live righteously. You will live soberly. Because there's power in the gospel to cleanse us, to purify us, and to change our desires, right? So that's what the grace of God is. That's what the grace of God is. Now I want to turn your guys' attention to meditating on the word day and night. Because this is his instruction from Joshua. It's wisdom for us. Let me. I, I, there's no Bible, there's no, there's no uh, time frame that I can give you. To say, well, you know, this is how long you should read. Right? But the Bible makes it very clear. How we should read his word. How long we should read his word. And he tells Joshua, what does he say? Meditate on the word. How long? Day and night. So how much time are you spending in the word of God? Daily. <laughs> See, our lives rob us. But what, what is, but see, look, this life robs us from the, the key that allows us to be successful, to enter in. Our priorities, earthly priorities, rob us from spending time with God. We give our times to our jobs. We give our times to ourselves. We give our times to food. We give our times to family. But do you give time for God? Eight hours of sleep. Eight hours of work. Two hours of eating. Yeah. Get, taking baths. Getting ready. That's 20 hours right there. So you got four hours left. Folks. This is why Jesus told us in Matthew 6 on how to live our lives. But I'm not going to get too much into that right now. But let's talk about the importance of meditating on the word day and night. We're going to park right here for a second. Now, this is the thing about meditating. Meditating on the word is not just dealing with the mind. It's not just thinking about God. But meditation also is in the heart. 
So the heart and the mind, God wants you to med- God wants those things, those aspects of us, to meditate on Him. Now here's the thing. Here's a scripture for that. In Psalms 19, verse 14, it says here, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. My strength, my redeemer. Let me ask you, is are the things that you meditate on acceptable to God? Would God accept the things that you think about on a daily basis? Does he want your mind to be where it is at all the time? Your heart and your mind. What is it meditating on? Think about that. I'm not don't don't answer. We got cameras and stuff. But listen. Is it acceptable? This prayer I believe is David. He says, "Let the words of my mouth." And this is the thing about meditation. Meditation isn't just to think upon d- deeply in the heart and in the mind, but it also means to speak the word. You can look that up. In the Greek, the word meditate It means not only to think upon in the heart and the mind, but it means to speak the word, to utter it. Why is that important? Because faith comes by hearing. Jesus, all he spoke was the word. Why? Because the word changes you, it changes the hearers, it changes the atmosphere. We're not just speaking the word just for the sake of practicing a religious practice. We're speaking the word to change the atmosphere and to exercise or to strengthen our faith. But what about thinking upon the word? What about meditating on it? I'm going to give you something here. One thing that I've learned about meditating on the word of God in my own personal walk is that meditation on the word produces fruitfulness fruitfulness and the second thing that it produces is revelation I want y'all to write that down I want y'all to take that down it produces fruitfulness and it produces revelation and divine encounters with God I don't, know, I don't know how many of you guys want a divine encounter with God. You want more understanding of the Word of God? You want to see more fruitfulness in your life? You want to see yourself grow in the Word? Meditate on it. Think about it. And you'll be, begin to get revelation. You'll be able to be, begin to get understanding. You'll begin to have divine encounters with the Spirit of God. Do you think that I'm just up here because I, I studied... For, you know, a couple minutes. I'm able to give this to you because I meditated on the word. And that meditation has opened up the word of God. It has allowed me to expound on it. And to teach it. And it's the same thing with you guys. So I'll share with you this. The first part I said fruitfulness. Turn to Psalms real quick. Meditation produces fruitfulness. Again, when I'm talking about meditation, specifically I'm talking about spending time with God. In the heart, in, in the heart, in the mind. So go to Psalms real quick. Psalms 1. Okay. Now listen to this verse. Ready? You ready, Mom? Okay. Psalms 1. And this is the first key to meditating on the Word. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Do you know what that means? Who's the ungodly? It's those who don't live for Jesus. The counsel of the ungodly is... Or in under the instruction of people who don't follow Jesus and who don't know the truth. Now I want to say this real quick. Before I get into this real quick. Hold on. 
So, when you talk about meditating, the Bible says in Romans 12, it says to be ye transformed, meaning you're going to be changed into a new creature. You're going to be perfected into the image of Christ by the renewing of your mind. It says, be ye transformed. Or you will see transformation when your mind is renewed. And how does your mind become renewed? Meditating, Meditating on the Word. That's how your mind becomes renewed. That's how you begin to be changed. If you're not seeing change in your life, it's because you're not meditating on the Word. And see, the media understands this. Science understands this. Entertainment, the entertainment business, they understand this stuff. The kingdom of darkness understands this stuff. This is why it's very important for us to watch what we're listening to and the things that we're bringing before our eyes. Because those that are in the world that are, are over the entertainment industry, they know. They know that all they have to do is put something, some good music, a good movie, that has all the violence and cussing filled with it, and it will begin to change you. Because you, you embrace it, if you embrace it. You understand? There's a science to this stuff. The Word of God makes it clear. You are renewed when you apply, when you read the Word. You're becoming transformed by the Word of God. How much even more if you read something or if you indulge in something or listening to something that is not the Word? What are you going to change into? You're going to change into what you're indulging in. This is why we have so much corruption in the world today. Because people have in, been allowed themselves to have be influenced by people who don't know God. And who don't know the Word. And they've seen their lives deteriorate over time. Because they've allowed another spirit to minister to them. Another word. Another gospel. A lie. And it begins to cause people to live in a type of way that God did not intend. This is another reason why God wants... So, I'll say this. Can, is it good... Do you want to be pure? Do you want to be pure? Will you be pure if you read the word and read this over here or indulge in this over here that's not the word but that is sinful and ungodly and unrighteous? Or will you be tainted? Will you become corrupt if you fill yourselves with pure water and salt water? You'll be corrupted. You know, it's crazy. I I'll say this, too. Let's say I bought you a new jar of honey. And you say, man, I, I say, I bought you some honey, man. I know how much you like honey. Or I bought you some jelly. I made some jelly or whatever. And you begin to go and use the jelly or the honey. And as you scoop it out, you put it on the bread and you see a one fly in there. Would you eat the jelly? Why? Because one fly spoiled the whole jar. Huh? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, if one fly can spoil the whole jar, how much can a little leaven spoil you? Jesus said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. All it takes is a small measure of corruption to corrupt everything. Eve sinned once. 
Adam sinned once. And we have this. Once. All it takes is once. One. One thing. Is God merciful? Yes. Is God forgiving? Yes. But see, this is the thing about corruption. God tells us to abstain from those things because he understands the effects of it. It isn't necessarily God saying, oh, you're, you did this, I'm going to judge you. No, that does happen. But it's what happened with Eve when she sinned once. Her eyes were opened. And now she had knowledge of all of these things that she didn't have before and she couldn't contain it. And she had these desires that were aroused in her. It wasn't God saying, okay, now because you sinned, I'm going to do, I'm going to make all these desires. Like, no, she sinned and her eyes were open. That was the result. So many people die off one, th they go, they, they commit one crime. I saw a guy, man, all he did was get pulled over for a seatbelt. For a seatbelt. He had it, but he ended up, his tag was, was wrong. And he had put a tag on, he had put a tag on his, uh, his old car. He put the old tag on the new car. You know you can't do that. License plate. He got pulled over, and the cops realized it. I was like, okay, you know, step out the car, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm, the cop said that he was gonna give him a ticket and just impound the car. He wasn't gonna take him to jail. Tell me why this guy drove off with the cop in the car with him, crashed, or the cop flew off, and then the guy kept driving and crashed and killed himself. Once. It took us once. One fly. All he was going to do was get a written ticket, have his car impounded, he would still have his life. I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to make you aware. And it's more so towards the willful things that we choose to do. The willful sins. It's not like God is saying, I'm waiting for you to sin. Alright, oh, I'm bring judgment. Like, yes, God does bring judgment. Absolutely. But it's usually the consequence that destroys us. There is a consequence to the things that we choose to willfully give ourselves to. You see? This is why I said we have to be sure. You want to be pure. So you fill yourself with the word. And you reject everything else. Because one fly will corrupt the whole jar. One fly. Make sense? So go to so go so I'm gonna share share with you the benefits now. The benefit, the first benefit of meditating on God's word is Psalms. I'm gonna go back to Psalms real quick. Here's the benefit. It says, Blessed is the man. That walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed. To those who don't follow. Those who are ungodly. You be blessed when you don't follow those who are ungodly. People think they're blessed because they have relationships with ungodly people. But Jesus says you're blessed when you follow the godly. <laughs> blessed is the man. That walks not in the counsel or in the instruction of those who are ungodly. Nor stands in the way of sinners. Meaning they're not doing what sinners do. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. They're not scorning at the word of God. But it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And in the law does he what? Meditate day and night. And then watch what it, look at the results of meditating. He shall be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of waters that brings forth his fruit. This is guaranteed, folks. Guaranteed. 
He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. In the season that God has made for you to bear fruit, you will bear fruit. And his leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper, because he meditates on the word day and night. So meditation produces fruitfulness. Spending time with God, you will produce it. Huh? And faithfulness. Meditation, folks. Not the meditation of the world, not yoga. Meditating on the Word and speaking the Word in the heart and in the mind. The second blessing of meditation that I have is that it produces revelation. And again, I said that before. And divine encounters with God's Spirit. It produces divine appointments. That's what, re that's what meditation does. When you're, when you're spending time with God, do you not think that God's going to give you understanding? God's going to give you understanding. He's going to give you revelation. But watch this. I'm going to show you even more. Go to Acts real quick. Acts chapter 10. These are all the benefits, folks. Y'all got any questions? No? Okay. Alright. Acts 10. Look at this. Look at this story right here. Go to verse 9. Right, in fact, uh... Yeah, verse 9. We're almost finished. It says here, everybody there? It says, on the morrow, on the next day, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up unto the house to pray. So what is Peter about to do? He's about to meditate. He's about to spend some time with God. He went into the house to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But watch this. But while they were made ready, he fell into a trance. He went to meditate and he began to have a vision. And saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending upon him, uh, uh, unto him. And it had, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth. And it says, Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and the fowls of the air. And there a voice came to him and said, which is God's voice, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now we know, that if you don't know the rest of the story, the rest of the story is basically God showing Peter that, first and foremost, there's not anything unclean. That God has made clean. There's no type of food that's unclean that God has made clean. Okay? So, it's like swine in the Old Testament. It was unclean. But it was an example for us. But God says, He made it. When He made swine, in the very beginning, did God make swine unclean or clean? Okay, was not all the animals good? Okay, so He only made it unclean in the Old Testament for an example of us not to eat of the unclean thing, the things of the world, the things that we've been talking about, the entertainment of the world. He made that as an example. But the animal is not unclean. God did not say when He made swine, and it is bad. He said it is good. Okay? But the second aspect of this is that through this vision, Peter realized that the gospel was not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. If Peter didn't have this vision, you and I wouldn't be able to preach this word. Because Peter went to pray, he had a revelation that God not only was here to save the Jews, but also you and me who are not Jews, according to the flesh. It changed the course of his ministry. Because he meditated. The course of your life can be changed by you praying and seeking God. The course of your life.
I think that's deep. <laughs> Look at the book of Revelation. Go to Revelation real quick. All right. God bless you. Revelation real quick. Check this out. So you guys know who wrote the book of Revelation? John. It says, I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the island called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. Meaning, he was locked up because he was preaching God's word. Uh, chapter 1. He was locked up. They sent him on an island. By him. They sent him on an island because he was preaching the word. And it says here that I was in the spirit. John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Does that mean that he was meditating? Yes. Can you be in the spirit and not be meditating on God's word? Be spending time with God? You absolutely can. That's the only way to be in the spirit is if you're meditating on God's word. If you're spending time. So watch what he says. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So he was meditating too. And he heard the voice of God. And it says, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So God is speaking to him. He says, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Listen, we have the book of Revelation because someone spent time with God. We understand the things that are happening now because God gave it to someone who spent time with him. People are waiting for you to spend time with him. To give other people instruction. This is why we're here today. And there's people for you. You can hear God's voice. When you meditate on his word day and night, you get understanding. You get revelation. You get uh, uh, divine appointments. You get uh, instruction for your life. Instruction for your ministry. And, and let me tell you something. We all have a ministry. There's no Christian that doesn't have a ministry. Now whether they choose to fulfill that ministry. That's up to them. But every Christian has a, has a ministry. And God wants to see it come to pass. And this is how it comes to pass. When you plant yourself in the waters of life. You know, there were women in the Old Testament. There were women in the Old Testament. And every morning, they would carry an empty vessel upon their shoulders. Or like the women in Africa, they'll carry the on their heads. And where do they go? To the well. Why? To get water. That's how we have to be. We have to know that we're empty. And we have to go every morning. And every night. And get water. Don't they drink the water? And don't they give the water to other people who are around them? Absolutely. God wants us. To spend time with him. In fact. This is how. This is how, this is how we live. And this is how we will make our way prosperous. This is how we will have good success. When we plant ourselves in the word of God. And the last thing. The last thing is this. Do you know that a way a man thinks, so he is. What does that mean? That meditation, the way that you think, is related to who you are. It reveals your identity. Proverbs says that. As a man thinks, so he is. Proverbs 7.23 Your identity is directly tied to how you think. How do you think? There's only two ways you can think, folks. You can be carnal-minded or you can be spiritually minded. There's a saying that people say, he's so heavenly-minded that he's no earthly good. 
<laughs> it's a lie. It's heavenly mindedness that allows us, that gives us the strength to be alive today. It's heavenly mindedness that pardoned our sins. It's heavenly mind. It's, God wants to bring heaven to where? Was Jesus earthly minded? No. But heavenly mindedness also was sufficient for the things of the earth. So me being wise in God will make my natural life prosperous. How do you think? Because as a man thinks, so is he. And here's the last verse. Romans 8. It ties into everything that we've been talking about. Romans 8. Now listen to these words carefully. Wow, how do I get the axe? Alright. Listen to this. For they that are after the flesh, that's the, that's the natural nature. That's your worldly nature. Do mind the things of the flesh. Meaning those that are after earthly things set their minds on earthly things what it means when it says those that are after it it's saying those that pursue earthly things they set their minds on earthly things and then he says but they that are after the spirit are those that are after God they set their mind on the things of God. As a man thinks, so is he. He says this, for to be carnally minded or earthly minded, it's death. That's not a cliche. It's death. It leads to death. Earthly mindedness leads to death. But to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Do you have peace in your life? So a lot of people that don't have peace, a lot of Christians that don't have peace in their life. And it, and it could be very well tied to the fact of their mentality. The way that they think. When you're living after the ways of the world. Whoa. Look at this. When you're living after the things of the world, you can do nothing else but put your trust in the things of the world. That's called earthly mindedness. That's called carnal mindedness. That's why people don't have peace. Like when people do uh, investments and they're constantly looking at the chart. Trying to see whether it's going up and down. They put their whole life into it. They put their whole life into it. And then what? When all their life is taken, they don't know what to do. They have no peace anymore. Because their life was sold into this natural investment that could do nothing for them. And people, there have been people that have thought they lost money and have killed themselves over investments. They've committed suicide because they lost their peace. And that's how it is when you put your trust in man. That's how it is when you put your trust in the government. That's how it is when you put your trust in 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 uh, uh, in, in in your job. That's how it is you put your trust in your degree. You work so hard. You work so hard in this life. And you think that you have stability. But then your job is taken from you. And you can't find a job because you're overqualified. You have no peace. And then what? Because they're natural minded. Natural mindedness will not bring anyone peace. They may have temporary peace. It's false. Like, let's say, let's say that their, their stocks do 
hit. And they get money, they, 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 they cash out and they get the money in their account. They're good for now. But a small little trimmer in their life is shake them up, man. Anything that threatens where they have put their peace in, they'll fall. But God, God, people, you can't see, God is undefeated. So if men threaten God, we know uh, we have peace because God's going God's to take us through. But if you threaten an idol, someone's idol, because no. no. idols don't have strength. Idols don't have mouths to speak. Idols don't have power to deliver. So threaten a man's idol and you threaten him. And he loses stability in life. He'll, he'll lose sleep. You see? That's why it's not wise to put your trust in things or in people or in yourself. Put your trust in God because he cannot be shaken. He cannot be moved. And he has a strong hand that delivers. So if you lack peace, it's probably because your mentality. You have to change the way you think. But your mindset has to be renewed. And that's something that's going to occur over time. But I can speak one word to someone and change their life. There's a guy that I was talking to who confessed the Lord Jesus uh, last week while doing an Uber. And he had no hope. But I gave him the hope of the gospel. And he said, you know, just hearing that has helped me right now. Because the word is life and peace. There's so many preachers out here talking about money and destiny in the world and success and prosperity. But then COVID hit. And now all the faith preachers, what are they going to preach when their life is taken? We should have been preaching the gospel. Because that's only where life is. That's where peace is. So you have to renew your mind. With the word of God. We have to stay meditating on the word of God day and night. So it says here. The carnal mind. It's it's enmity against God. God bless you. It's enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. And neither indeed can it be. You see. Do you want to please God? Carnal mindedness doesn't please God. Being natural minded. Jesus is our prime example. He only came to do one thing, the will of his Father. And God is a spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So he was spiritually minded. And we're come to do what? Not to set up our own ministries, but to finish the ministry of Christ. Got to be spiritually minded. The world doesn't need another earthly minded Christian. We have too many of them. The world doesn't need another politician. They've been voting for years. And every four years people get upset. No one's ever happy. No one's happy. But with Jesus, life and peace. Find a true genuine Christian. They found peace. They found life. And if they're seasoned, they've realized that this world is not sufficient. For anything. Only Christ. Is sufficient in all things. You see. Only Christ. So if you want to please God. Meditate on his word. Become spiritually minded. You'll be fruitful in your life. You'll see the fruit. But remember. Keep yourselves from the fly. The fly. The one fly of corruption that spoils the whole jar. All it took Adam was one sin. Again. We have all of this. But all it takes is one act of righteousness. And you can shift. The life of somebody. Your own life. So you guys got any questions? Amen. That's it, man.
That's it. Um. Yeah. Life and peace, guys. And that's the keys right there, man. We got to determine, is this what we want?